Okay, so you sent over some uh, really compelling sources this time. We're diving into super volcanoes, specifically, well, the big one everyone talks about, Yellowstone. That's right, and you got two quite different perspectives, didn't you? One was this um, very dramatic video portrayal. Yeah, almost like a disaster movie clip. Exactly. And the other, a much more, let's say, sober scientific text looking at super eruptions generally. So our mission today for you listening is to kind of bridge that gap, right? Go past the uh, the Hollywood explosions and really get into the science, the actual probabilities and, well, the real potential impacts. Precisely. It's a great opportunity to compare the, you know, the immediate shock value with the longer term geological view. Let's kick things off with that shock value then, because that video, wow, it didn't pull any punches. It started talking about total devastation um, within a hundred mile radius of Yellowstone. Yeah. And that part. I mean, it reflects the reality of pyroclastic flows. These are incredibly hot, fast-moving flows of gas and rock. That's unimaginable energy. It's unimaginable is a good word. Within that immediate zone, yeah, obliteration is probably accurate. And then it went wider. Ashfall, like uh, potentially three feet of it in some areas. That sounds almost unbelievable. It does, but it's consistent with past super eruptions. And the video rightly pointed out the consequences collapsing roofs is a major one. Right, the sheer weight of it. Exactly. Buildings just aren't designed for that. Plus, total crop failure, buried completely. And air travel just stops everywhere. <laughs> Instantly. Ash is incredibly dangerous for jet engines. So yeah, massive, immediate disruption, global scale. Then the video brought up this idea of a volcanic winter, which sounds... Yeah. Chilling. It is. The concept is that all the ash and, importantly, the sulfur gases shot way up into the stratosphere. They block the sun. Essentially, yes. They reflect sunlight back into space. The video mentioned a potential global temperature drop of, what, up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit? Yeah. Which sounds maybe not huge numerically, but globally, that changes everything, doesn't it? Profoundly. Agriculture, weather patterns, entire ecosystems would be thrown completely out of whack. Mm. Massive stress worldwide food production issues. And following from that, the video laid out these societal impacts. Um, food shortages, obviously. Prices soaring. Water contamination. Which leads to disease, of course. And famine. People having to move. Mass displacement. It painted this really grim domino effect. And while it's an extreme scenario, it's, well, it's a plausible cascade of events following a catastrophe of that magnitude. Infrastructure breakdown, public health crises, it would lead to immense hardship. The video ended on this note of like total global economic collapse, climate chaos lasting maybe a decade or more. And recovery taking generations. It's a truly apocalyptic vision, yes. <laughs> okay, so let's pivot now. Let's bring in that scientific text you shared. It offers a maybe less dramatic, but really essential perspective. How does science actually define a super eruption? What makes it super? It really comes down to volume. The key metric is the amount of erupted material, the magma, which becomes ash and pumice mostly. A super eruption is defined as one that ejects more than 450 cubic kilometers of this stuff. 450 cubic kilometers. It's hard to even like wrap your head around that volume. It's truly immense, almost incomprehensible. And the text really hammered home how rare these are. Only 13 identified in the last 2.6 million years from just 10 volcanoes. That's right. And seeing that number, it does provide crucial context, doesn't it? Compared to the video's immediacy. It definitely puts the probability in perspective. While the consequences are huge, the likelihood in any given century or even millennium seems very low. Extremely low for any specific system, yes. These are rare geological events separated by vast, vast stretches of time. The paper listed some examples. Shranui in New Zealand uh, about 25,500 years ago. Yeah, that was around 530 cubic kilometers. Toba in Indonesia 74,000 years ago. That one was even bigger. And Yellowstone itself, right. 631,000 years ago and another one way back 2.08 million years ago. Exactly. Seeing those dates really emphasizes the geological timescales we're operating on here. Very different from human timescales. Something else the text pointed out was that there's no clear trend. They're not getting more frequent or less frequent. They just happen sporadically. Which tells us something important about prediction, right? If there's no regular cycle, predicting based just on past frequency is, well, unreliable. Yeah, it's not like predicting, say, crime statistics based on past patterns. The underlying processes are far more complex and maybe chaotic. Precisely. The conditions needed to cook up a super eruption just don't seem to arise on a predictable schedule. And this was maybe one of the most important points for places like Yellowstone. 
The paper stressed that not every eruption from a supervolcano is a super eruption. Absolutely critical. The term supervolcano itself can be a bit misleading. It refers to a volcano capable of a super eruption, but most of its eruptions are much, much smaller. Like the Taupu example they gave. It had its huge Huanui eruption, but since then, 28 smaller ones. Exactly. And the largest of those subsequent eruptions was only around 35 cubic kilometers. Still big but nowhere near the super threshold. So a rumble at Yellowstone doesn't automatically mean the end is nigh. That's actually quite reassuring in a way. It should be. The vast majority of activity at these large caldera systems is non-super. The text also listed other potential super volcano sites. You mentioned Toba and Taupo already, but also Campi Fligre in Italy. Air Caldera in Japan, Long Valley in California. Right, so Yellowstone isn't alone. Does having multiple sites globally increase the overall odds, you think, even if each one is individually unlikely? Well, statistically, yes, slightly. If you have more lottery tickets, your chance of someone winning goes up. But the odds for each individual system remain incredibly low in any given year or century. The overall global probability is higher than for just one, but still very, very small on human timescales. So prediction. The paper basically says forecasting these is incredibly hard, right? Not like smaller, more frequent eruptions where you might see more regular patterns. It's a huge challenge. Partly because they're so rare, we just don't have many events to study to find reliable precursors. Yeah. And partly because we're still figuring out the deep plumbing, you know. How does that enormous amount of eruptible magma actually accumulate? And what's the trigger? What finally makes it go? Exactly. Those are the multi-billion dollar questions in volcanology. So the research focus now, as the text highlighted, is more on understanding what's currently happening underneath, looking for signs of large melt reservoirs. Yes, trying to detect large bodies of magma that are mostly molten, which is thought to be a prerequisite. And monitoring ground deformation is the ground swelling or sinking. Changes in gases coming out, earthquake patterns. All of those, yes. Monitoring ground movement, gas emissions, seismic activity, these are the standard tools. But interpreting those signals in the context of a potential super eruption is the really tricky part. Does a particular swarm of earthquakes mean a small hydrothermal event, a regular small eruption, or the, uh, the very beginnings of something enormous? Still a lot of uncertainty there. A tremendous amount. We're getting better. Technology improves. Our understanding deepens. But predicting a super eruption with any kind of certainty, we're not there yet. Okay, so wrapping this up for you listening, it feels like the big takeaways are, well, first, that the video, while dramatic, wasn't entirely wrong about the potential devastation. A super eruption would be a global catastrophe. Absolutely. The potential impact is undeniable and truly global. Food supplies, climate, economy everything. But, and this is the crucial but from the science, these are exceptionally rare geological events. The probability of one happening in our lifetimes or even our grandchildren's lifetimes is statistically very, very low. Exactly. It's about balancing that immense potential impact against the extremely low probability, understanding both the drama and the deep time context. And the video did actually end on a useful note talking about preparedness. Even if we can't stop it, things like early warning, global cooperation, education, they seem sensible, right? Given the stakes, however remote. Completely sensible. Investing in better monitoring, ongoing research into the processes, having robust international emergency plans. These are prudent steps regardless. They help us prepare for any large volcanic event, not just the super rare super eruptions. So here's something for you to chew on after we finish. We've talked about these immense geological timescales and these potentially civilization altering consequences. How should we as societies balance preparing for these incredibly low probability but super high impact events against all the immediate pressing problems that demand our resources right now? That's the real challenge, isn't it? The ultimate long-term versus short-term planning dilemma. It really is, definitely something to think about. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the world beneath our feet.